let's roll all of these stories in together because all the questions that we continue to get are about vaccinations, are about hospitalizations, are about lockdowns. Sid Sixero joins for this conversation, and we are talking about all of it. First, let's begin with AstraZeneca, temporarily pausing that shot for those under the age of 55. And with those new changes, there are questions and there are very valid concerns. Uh, so we are going to navigate all of this. We're going to bring in infectious disease physician, Dr. Zane Chagla, as well as clinical pharmacy practitioner, Brenda Chang. You've heard from both of them both before on this show today. And we're going to weave through some of your questions. Good morning to you both. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Said go for it. Good morning. Uh, uh, Dr. Chagla, let's, let's start with you. The news from Pfizer out of the U.S. today of 100% effectiveness in latest trials between ages 12 to 15. Emotionally, I know what my reaction is to that. What is your clinical reaction to that? <laughs> yeah, I, I have the same emotional reaction as you. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, it made sense. You know, kids' immune systems really are maturing by the age of seven or eight. So a 12 year old really is a little adult in, in many senses. There shouldn't really be any differences. And I think we've confirmed this, which is great. You know, this means the immunization program can roll out to many, many more people, particularly high school students, where we're seeing transmission. But when we look at somewhere like Moderna, uh, testing what the trials as low as six months old, that makes it a little bit different, throws a wrench into some of those things. Do you have an update uh, by any chance on where these trials stand? Yeah, I know the Pfizer trial had finished enrolling by Christmas, so they're starting to see the results now. I think Moderna was still enrolling around January, which means, you know, they got to wait a couple of months before they start releasing results. They can't just give everyone the immunization. They have to wait to see if they work in that sense. So, you know, keep tuned. I think in the next month or two, we're going to start hearing about what Moderna's is. And then again, that younger trial is really enrolling now. So we got to wait probably a few months before we start hearing that. Okay. Uh, Brenda, obviously we heard from Premier Ford yesterday. He's concerned with the holiday weekend uh, approaching. We've been talking about it all morning. How concerned are you at uh, spread increasing here because of just people not doing what they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, that's very important. I think overall, um, our public health guidelines haven't changed, and it's really important for us to stay safe, um, keep our distance, wear our mask, um, wash our hands frequently. It is very important at this time. We are definitely in the third wave, and it's really important for us all to stay safe at this time. I want to put this question to both Brenda and Zane. Um, all the conversation right now is about AstraZeneca and the hesitancy around this shot. We saw this poll saying, uh, the latest poll, 53% were confident in the AstraZeneca shot. And that's compared to 82% for Pfizer and 77% with Moderna, respectively. We've also heard from the Prime Minister saying the best shot is the first shot that you have available to you. So, uh, Brenda, we'll begin with you. The concerns when it comes to blood clots, how concerned should Canadians be? So what we're hearing about the blood clots is actually a very rare condition. Um, the incidence is extremely low and initially first estimated at about one in a million. And the more recent reports is closer to one in 100,000. And so these are very rare types of blood clots um, that occur also with low platelet count. So these typically do not occur regularly. And, you know, the concern for this is this blood clot is really, really low, and we have to really keep that in mind. Um, in the general population, blood clots occur much more frequently, especially as we get older. So really, this, this um, reported concern of blood clots is very, very low. And for you as well, Dr. Chagla, so I, obviously Health Canada is taking several precautions. Do you anticipate that they're going to open up, again, vaccinations for those 55 and under using AstraZeneca again? Yeah, I mean, I think we're waiting for data. This is a rapidly evolving situation. Much of the data is not in Canada. Clearly, this is happening in Europe. And so they are going to meet with their regulatory agency, put everything together, look through mechanisms, look through all of the people that have been immunized and get a better profile of who is developing this reaction versus who is safe. Right now, we've taken the appropriate steps. Many of these people are under the age of 50. And so limiting the use to 55 really, you know, takes that one in a hundred thousand to back to one in a million or even higher in that sense, where we would accept some risk, knowing that we're living in a public health emergency. Dr. Chagla, hypothetical, and I'm hearing this a lot. Um, my parents got the, they haven't, but just a hypothetical. My parents <laughs> got the Pfizer vaccine two weeks ago. I'm comfortable getting together for the holiday weekend. The trust is high in the Pfizer vaccine, as Melanie stated. What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, we're learning more about what one shot looks like. And, and, you know, in clinical trials, it was as high as 90%. In real life, it's looking around 80% for preventing symptomatic COVID-19. Some of the UK data suggests, you know, a 70% reduction in hospitalization and a reduction in death. 
So it's not perfect. This is what I'm, I'm trying to get at here, right? So if you're if you're going to do a gathering like that, put more layers of protection in outside of just the vaccine. Do it outdoors. Make physical contact brief if, if not avoiding it. But still, you can have that contact, recognizing that you know, you're adding, you know, the outdoors, good ventilation, distancing. And the effects of the vaccine on top of that as a as a safety net, rather than just relying on the vaccine alone, which may not be perfect in this scenario. Okay, we've been bringing in a lot of our viewer questions uh, built into these questions that we've been asking you, but let's bring in some specifics. Mike tweeting us this seems to be confusing information about the spread of COVID after vaccination. So this goes to your point, Sid, but even more so, can you still infect even though you've had your shot, is the shot basically just an assurance that you won't die of COVID-19? What are the chances of dying or severe illness if that happens? Um, so I don't know if we want to go to Brenda or Zayn. Who would like to take this? How about Brenda? All, right. <laughs> All yours, Brenda. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so for sure, uh, it's important to really think about the um, vaccine efficacy after one dose, which we've already talked about. Um, and in the case of the, the vaccines that uh, we've seen, it is really important to see that uh, after one dose, we do have really good efficacy. But essentially, after um, two doses, we get the, the best efficacy that we can see. Um, so that's really important. Okay, Zane, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we are getting more emerging data. I mean, when we, these trials were released, we talked about, you know, the, the, that these were just symptomatic COVID-19 preventions, but more data from real life. I mean, what we're seeing in long-term care is the greatest example in Ontario. Despite what's happening outside with 2,300 cases a day, there are nine cases in long-term care, period, in Ontario. And again, that really does say that that transmission is really blocked from person to person, not just that people feel better after getting the vaccine if they get COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Chekla, I do want to get in one more question, and Go this ahead. is one we've had this conversation, Sid, about that four-month waiting period between shot one and yes. shot two, um, and whether or not we need to tweak uh, a little bit here. I want to get your take on that, and specifically the tweet coming to us uh, from Parker saying, why is Canada the only country in the world to wait four months between administering uh, between one and two? Also, if the government has this data, when will they make that available for the public to see? I think a lot of people are talking about transparency here. So, Dr. Chegla, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, so there, there are now are a couple of groups in Ontario that will get their shots on time. We talked about long-term care. People with cancer and transplants are also approved to get their shots on time based on data coming out of the UK. Now, the UK is really defining this experience for us. And so we are going to look to them to say what the data is for the delay. There was some recent data released, though, healthcare workers who got their, their shots. And again, the concern for us is that at some point, the, the immune system is going to stop working, that this shot is going to be stopped becoming effective. We're not actually seeing that. So the most recent UK healthcare worker data is up to day 90, people's protection gets better and better and better and actually almost starts approaching that of getting a second shot. Not perfect, but getting there. And so, you know, recognizing the immune system is not like a light switch. It is a very, very subtle change that happens over time. This is really good news that a four month strategy is likely gonna preserve immunity and buy us more doses for the population, which is gonna have huge population based effects. Uh, Dr. Chagla, Brenda, I think uh, we answered some important questions. Uh, permission to bug you again down the line because we have plenty more. Have a Thanks great so day. Thanks for waking up with us today. Thank, Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Great questions. Fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, all right.